On the screen is an example of a third degree heart block. With a third degree heart block, also known as a complete heart block, we no longer have any communication between the atria and the ventricles through the electrical conduction pathway system. This person essentially has two heartbeats, an atrial rate and a ventricular rate. The atrial rate will tend to be faster. In fact, that atrial rate, which we will measure solely by our P waves, may be in a relatively normal rate, say between 60 and 100. However, our ventricular rate, which will be noted by our QRS complexes, will be significantly slower due to the lower intrinsic rate in the ventricles. A third degree heart block will be regular in terms of P wave to P wave or QRS to QRS. There will be P waves, however, the P waves and QRS complexes will not correspond to each other. Typically, we will see many more P waves compared to QRS complexes. And because of the complete dissociation between our P waves and our QRS complexes, there is no meaningful PR interval. In a third degree heart block, the QRS complex may be either wide or narrow, depending upon the location of the ventricular pacemaker that's creating the QRS complexes that are associated with this rhythm. If the ventricular pacemaker is higher up in the heart, say towards the junction or the bundles of his, then we may see a narrow QRS complex. And if our ventricular pacemaker is lower in the heart, say along the Purkinje fibers, then we will see a wider QRS complex. This rhythm is a systole. There is a complete lack of any energy detected by the ECG, and this will display on the screen as a flat line. The lack of energy detected may be due to the lack of energy within the heart, or it may indicate equipment failure, such as a misplaced lead. None of the six criteria that we use to evaluate an ECG is applicable in a systole. On the screen is an example of atrial fibrillation, or AFib. Let's walk through our six criteria so that we can evaluate this rhythm. First, note that the rhythm is fast. Atrial fibrillation can be at a normal rate though, but this particular rhythm is roughly 140 beats per minute. Second, note that the rhythm is irregular. In fact, it is irregularly irregular with no defined pattern. Third, there are no P waves. Instead, we have small fibrillation waves because the atria is simply quivering in the patient's chest because of the chaotic energy that's present. Because there are no P waves, the questions of is there a QRS complex for each P wave and is the PR interval normal are meaningless. And lastly, note that this is a narrow complex rhythm. On the screen is an example of an atrial flutter rhythm. This rhythm is similar to atrial fibrillation in that the atria are sending out signals outside of the normal conduction system. Using our six criteria, we note that the rhythm is fast compared to normal. The rhythm is also regular, but there are no P waves. Instead, we have sawtooth-like flutter waves in their place. Since there are no P waves, the questions about if there's a QRS complex for each P wave and PR interval are meaningless. And finally, the QRS complex is narrow. On the screen, you can see a depiction of a first degree heart block. However, be aware that first degree block is a dependent rhythm, meaning that we need to determine the underlying rhythm first, and then we'll be able to determine if there is a first degree block present. In this particular case, we have what appears to be a normal sinus rhythm. The rate is normal, it is regular, there are P waves and a QRS complex for each P wave, and this is a narrow complex rhythm. But note that the PR interval is elongated compared to normal. This is the hallmark of a first degree heart block, the elongated PR interval due to the increased transmission time required for that electrical impulse to travel from the atria to the junction and then onward to the ventricles. Therefore, when we identify a first degree heart block, we must also identify the underlying rhythm. In this heart rhythm, we would call this a sinus rhythm with a first degree heart block. On the screen is an example of a normal sinus rhythm. Remember though, normal simply means that it meets all six of the criteria that we use to evaluate an ECG. The rate is between 60 to 100. The rhythm is regular. There are P waves and there is a QRS complex that corresponds for each P wave. The PR interval is normal. If this was printed out, we would see that it is between three to five small boxes. 
or 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. And finally, this is a narrow complex rhythm. On the screen is an example of a second degree Mobitz type 1 heart block. Let's use our criteria to analyze this rhythm. A second degree type 1 heart block is generally at a normal rate. However, it is an irregular rhythm and at times may appear to become bradycardic or slower than normal. There are P waves present, however, we do not have a curious complex for each P wave, and we quickly notice that there are differences in our PR intervals from one cardiac complex to the next. We will see a gradual lengthening in our PR intervals until eventually we have a P wave that is not followed by a QRS complex. This is where we have the phrase longer, longer, longer dropped when we discuss second degree type 1 heart blocks because of the gradual lengthening of that PR interval until eventually we have that P wave not followed by a QRS, the dropped. The reason for this gradual lengthening in our PR interval is due to the increased difficulty in the transmission of the energy from the atria to the ventricles until eventually a P wave is generated without a corresponding QRS because this energy was not able to be transmitted through the junction into the ventricles. Our last criteria, the width of the QRS complex, will otherwise be normal. On the screen, you can see an example of a second degree type 2 heart block. Let's analyze this rhythm according to the criteria that we defined earlier. The rate of the second degree type 2 heart block is generally normal or slow, and this rhythm will be irregular. There are P waves present, however, we do not see a QRS complex for each P wave. Our PR interval will be inconsistent. When we have a P wave that is followed by a QRS, we will generally see a normal PR interval. However, there will be times where there is a P wave with no corresponding QRS. This is because of the conduction difficulty that arises when the energy wave tries to travel from the atria to the ventricles and will either be conducted or will not be conducted. If we have our energy conducted, we'll see a P wave followed by a QRS. If the energy is not conducted, then we will see a P wave with no corresponding QRS. For our last criteria, the width of the QRS complex, this may appear as either wide or narrow, depending on the severity of the heart block, but will generally appear to be narrow. On the screen is an example of sinus tachycardia. Looking at our six criteria, we note immediately that the rate is faster than that of the normal sinus rhythm. In all other respects though, this is identical to a sinus rhythm. The rhythm is regular, there are P waves, there is a QRS complex for each P wave, the PR interval is normal between three to five small boxes, and the QRS complex is narrow. Essentially, we have a sinus rhythm, it's just that the rate is faster compared to normal. On the screen is an example of a supraventricular tachycardia rhythm. You'll notice right away that this is a rapid rhythm with a rate over 200. However, it may be difficult to see the P waves in an SVT due to the rapid rate. The P waves will appear to be buried within the preceding T wave, therefore detecting the P wave may be difficult, but there will be P waves and a QRS complex corresponding to each P wave. The PR interval in an SVT may be difficult to determine due to the obscured P waves, but will be otherwise normal, and an SVT will always be a narrow complex rhythm. When an SVT converts into another rhythm, for instance into a sinus rhythm, and this occurs spontaneously, in other words, without a medical intervention, we refer to this rhythm as a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. On the screen is an example of torsade de Poin. This rhythm is actually a variant of ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC. In torsade de Poin, we will have different morphologies in our QRS complexes. In other words, we'll have different heights and different widths for these complexes. Therefore, unlike ventricular tachycardia, torsade de Poin will be in irregular rhythm. The advanced provider, or an AED, will recognize torsade de Poin as a variant of VTAC and recommend a defibrillatory shock. On the screen is an example of ventricular fibrillation, or VFib. Remember, with VFib, we have chaotic energy within the heart, both in the atria and in the ventricles. This will be represented by a chaotic and unfocused rhythm on our ECG monitor. 
There is no rate. This is not a regular rhythm. There are no P waves or QRS complexes. Therefore, none of our criteria can apply to ventricular fibrillation. On the screen is an example of ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC. Right away we can see that this is a fast rhythm, and VTAC generally has a rate over 150 per minute. This rhythm is also regular, but there are no P waves, and therefore we can't answer the question of a QRS complex for each P wave. Likewise, there is no PR interval that we can measure, and the QRS complexes in VTAC will be wide, hence the alternative name for VTAC of wide complex tachycardia. On the screen, you can see an example of ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC. Ventricular tachycardia is generally a very rapid rhythm. However, it can be relatively slow. For instance, this VTAC, which has a rate of around 140. Continuing with our analysis, we'll see that this is a regular rhythm, but there are no P waves, and therefore we cannot correlate a QRS complex for every P wave. Likewise, there is no PR interval to measure. Finally, VTAC will always show wide QRS complexes.